This is Garrett Chobi. This is a case of an endoscopic septoplasty. This is a patient with long-standing nasal area obstruction that is primarily left-sided. He has tried uh, numerous topical sprays and rinses through the years, but has had persistent obstruction and his exam demonstrated a large left-sided nasal septal deviation. For these cases, I will typically infiltrate local anesthetic. This is 1% lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. And here we are injecting in multiple points on the left side, and then also injecting on the contralateral side, as you can see here. Ideally, you will have this injection directly against the cartilage in a sub-mucoperichondral plane, as you can see here, to be able to lift that away uh, for raising the flaps uh, in the near future here. The next step is planning where your initial mucosal incision will take place. Ideally, this will take place anterior to where the deviation starts. Here I'm pointing out uh, multiple places where you could consider making it, but of course we'll make it here in a more anterior fashion. It should be pointed out that your cartilaginous incision does not have to exactly be where your mucosal incision is. Instead, you can stagger these uh, to a certain extent and make your cartilaginous incision somewhat posterior to where your mucosal incision is. So here you are with a curved beaver blade making a rather anterior mucosal incision as you can see here. The idea is to get this through the mucosa and through the periochondrium, but of course not through the cartilage itself. Here we are with a suction freer beginning to raise this flap. This is the most important part of raising the flap is getting in that initial proper plane. So we're using a caudal elevator here and scraping inferiorly to really get through that uh, perichondrium and establishing that proper plane as you can see here. And once you're in that plane with the suction elevator, especially in primary cases, this should raise up uh, very quickly and nicely for you in a rather avascular plane. We're just completing that incision a little bit higher there with our uh, knife again. And then it's nice to raise this in a very broad front, including uh, very dorsally and towards the floor of the nose to have nice wide exposure to decide where you want to take your uh, cartilaginous cuts. So here we are raising this a bit more posteriorly, as you can see here. We're still in the cartilage here, just in front of the uh, bony cartilaginous junction. And then here we are getting onto the bone uh, of, the, of the bony uh, septum here, just past that bony cartilaginous junction, and raising that more inferiorly as well. Here we are showing the most caudal aspect of the nose and the caudal edge of the septum in comparison to where we would make a proposed cartilaginous incision, as you can see illustrated here. Ideally, you'd like to leave at least a centimeter and a half of caudal strut, as you can see in this particular location, making that uh, vertical incision with a sharp freer elevator coming through the cartilage itself and then beginning to raise the contralateral flap, but of course not coming through the mucosa on the contralateral side. As you can see in this example, we've staggered a bit our cartilaginous incision from our mucosal incision, and uh, that'll allow a little extra protection uh, to ensure we don't have any issues with healing when we enclose this incision at the end of the case. Here we are establishing the submucoperichondral plane on the contralateral side with a suction elevator, as you can see here. And then we're gonna just take a small window out with an open Jansen Middleton forceps in order to allow us to see that contralateral side a bit better. And we'll go ahead and raise the contralateral flap once again in a submucoperichondral plane. And what you'll be able to see here is that this is again a nice uh, clean plane, uh, relatively avascular with minimal bleeding as you can see here, getting us uh, access to the isolated cartilage in order to address that. The key parts in this elevation are ensuring that the primary pressure you're putting is actually on the cartilage and bone uh, and then that will subsequently lift away the flap for you. And it, the idea is not to push on the flap itself, which uh, subsequently will reduce your risk of a tear uh, if you're putting that pressure on the bone and cartilage and not on the flap itself. And here we are dissecting on the right side uh, down towards the floor of the nose to really where the cartilage meets the maxillary crest. Once the cartilage has been isolated on both sides, you can then use instrument like this open Jansen Middleton forceps to create a bit of a larger window for yourself by removing some of that deviated uh, cartilage and bone. And now we'll begin to work uh, low in the nose at the junction of the cartilage itself with the maxillary crest. This can be a tricky part to elevate as the mucoperichondrium transitions to mucoperiosteum over the maxillary crest itself. And the key part here is really isolating that remaining cartilage. 
uh, to reduce the risk of getting a tear in the flap. The cartilage typically flares a bit inferiorly where it connects to the maxillary crest. You can see it beginning to here as really isolating this last bit of cartilage. After the cartilage has been completely isolated on both sides, you can then use your suction elevator, almost like a spade shovel, to dig the last piece of cartilage off of the maxillary crest, as you can see here. And that allows you to lift this away from the maxillary crest bone in an atraumatic way, and then go ahead and lift this last bit of cartilage uh, out of the nostril. This is frequently a challenging area, once again, due to that tough transition of the mucopericonjurum to the mucoperiosteum. But if you do it in a, in a technique where it's been isolated on both sides completely, you really have a relatively little chance of tearing your flaps, and you can lift that whole piece of cartilage out, as you can see in this example, directly off of the maxillary crest, and then remove it from the flaps here. We notice that there's still a bit of a dorsal deviation. This is a very careful dissection because we're working high uh, towards the skull base in this area. I like the open Jansen Middleton here because it's essentially a large through cut and allows you to slowly nibble away additional cartilage and bone without twisting it all in the skull base. And it's also important to re-examine your nasal cavity, as you can see here. You can see some more of a high deviation there with plenty of room to go uh, a bit more dorsally in the flaps. So here we are going to dissect again a little bit higher to isolate uh, that bone and collar, as you can see here. And then here we come in trimming a little bit more of the dorsal uh, strut here with that open Jansen middle tin in order to allow us to fully see the axilla of the middle terminate on the left side. And then here we're isolating that last bit of that cartilage off the more posterior maxillary crest, as you can see here, uh, once again transitioning that dissection from the cartilage onto the bone inferiorly and then isolating this and then subsequently uh, removing it. And here's that last piece coming in out now with a uh, closed Jansen Middleton. We've already released it superiorly, so not worried about uh, an issue high at the skull base there and with its removal. And then of course, at the end of the case, re-examining the patient's nasal airway, and ensuring that you're satisfied with it uh, prior to closure. I typically will close uh, in a quilting fashion with a four O'Keefe needle. So here we are just behind the incision going across the septum and then coming back in front of that in order to close the incision and then we'll continue to quilt uh, more posteriorly as you can see here. This is an absorbable stitch that's passed uh, through and through. Here we're pulling that mucosa right up to the edge of the incision there to ensure that uh, residual cartilage is nicely covered. We'll go back and forth a few times to help close some dead space and then we'll tie it off in the patient's uh, left nasal cavity. Doyle splints are optional. I don't use them in all cases, but in select cases, I think they're helpful to kind of hold things in place in the middle and allow adequate space while the patient heals. So here we are inserting the left-sided uh, splint nice and low along the floor of the nose. And then we'll put in the right-sided splint and secure them uh, anteriorly with a uh, nylon stitch. Here is the nylon stitch being placed I like to make sure that the front edge of the doyle splint covers over the site of my incision, in this case on the left side. Then we'll pass this through uh, the hole of the doyle splint on both sides, and then simply pierce the splint itself a little further back to ensure that uh, the suture does not cheese wire through it and tear. In summary, with an endoscopic septoplasty, the most important key initial step is establishing your sub mucoperichondrial plane and raising your flap in that plane. It's of course imperative that you leave adequate caudal and dorsal support for the patient's nasal tip. And lastly, there is some significant differences between doing an endoscopic septoplasty and an open or an endonasal septoplasty with a speculum. Careful consideration should be given to both approaches when selecting a given approach for a certain patient.